Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Welcome to the InBridge Inc. Third Quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. My name is Polly and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session for the investment community. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Jonathan Morgan, Vice President, Investor Relations. Jonathan, you may begin. Thank you, Tolly. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Embridge Inc.'s third quarter 2021 earnings call. Joining me this morning are Al Monaco, President and Chief Executive Officer, Vern Yu, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Colin Grunding, Executive Vice President, Liquids Pipeline, Bill Yardley, Executive Vice President, Gas Transmission and Midstream. Cynthia Hansen, Executive Vice President, Gas Distribution and Storage. And Matthew Ackman, Senior Vice President, Strategy, Power and New Energy. As per usual, this call will be webcast and I encourage those listening on the phone to follow along with the supporting slide. A replay of the call will be available later today and a transcript will be provided to, on the website shortly after. <laughs> We will try to keep the call to roughly one hour, and in order to get to as many answers to your questions as possible, we'll be limiting the questions to one plus a single follow-up if necessary. We'll be prioritizing questions from the investment community, so if you are a member of the media, please direct your inquiries to our communications team who will be happy to respond. As always, our investor relations team will be available following the call for any de detailed follow-up questions. On to slide two, where I'll remind you that we'll be referring to forward-looking information in today's presentation and Q&A. And by its nature, this information contains for forecast assumptions and expectations about future outcomes, which are subject to the risks and uncertainties outlined here and discussed more fully in our public disclosure filings. We'll also be referring to the non-GAAP measures, which are summarized below. And with that, I'll turn it over to Al Monaco. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Well, to start off here, what you see in the photo is our new Ingleside Energy Centre near Corpus Christi, with a VLCC just being manoeuvred into place for loading. It's an important investment for us on many fronts, so we'll come back to Ingleside in a few minutes. It's been a strong quarter operationally and financially, so Vern will take you through the results. By the way, Vern was recently appointed CFO. He's held a number of senior financial roles at Enbridge and most recently headed up our liquids business, which Colin Grunding has taken over. I'll cover the high points of what's been a catalyst quarter and year for us, followed by a business update. Before I do that, though, let me speak to the current state of the energy markets. And as a reminder, our perspective on this is from a company that's been focused on the energy transition for years. It's obvious we need to reduce global emissions and that we're moving to a lower a carbon economy. And we think that existing infrastructure is essential to that transition. As you heard us say before, we see ourselves as a bridge to a cleaner energy future by leveraging our businesses and by achieving our own emissions goals. We're transitioning our asset mix in line with changing fundamentals and building on our early mover advantage in wind, solar, hydrogen, and RNG. But it's also very clear that energy demand will continue to grow and that economic growth will always depend on conventional energy. So squaring these two realities comes down to the pace of transition and ensuring we secure low cost, reliable energy supply while that happens. The realities of this careful balance are playing out in energy markets today. Stimulus spending and recovery are driving GDP growth. Oil, gas and product demand are up 
and should outpace last year on the way to pre-pandemic levels. Pet chem demand was resilient through COVID, but now even jet fuel has come back. As you've seen, natural gas demand is extreme, particularly in Asia and Europe. So consumption is up and supply disruptions and tight inventories are creating an imbalance. Now, normally all of that is self-correcting as supply response, but this energy crisis that we're in right now is entirely about underinvestment in all forms of energy, which is creating havoc with consumers, industrial competitiveness, and inflation. Higher energy prices are impacting consumers in developed and developing countries. Spikes in electricity prices, heating, cooking, and filling up the tank. Higher industrial feedstock costs also impact competitiveness, and again, that rolls out to the consumer. So agriculture, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, transportation, components, technology, and housing. And supply issues are impacting reliability. We see rolling blackouts and rationing in China and India, increasing coal power generation, of all things, in Germany. Fuel shortages in the UK, and the U.S. Northeast, gas generation is running at five-year highs. And we're seeing switching to fuel oil for electric generation. All of that to say, the energy transition is a reality, but we need to be thoughtful about the pace and execution with the consumer in mind. And it's clear, if it wasn't before, that conventional energy will be a critical part of the supply mix for a long time. So the point being here that the transition needs to be driven by a mix of balanced policy solutions. Most important in our view, we have to embrace natural gas because it's simply the enabler of building more wind and solar supply, among other things. And it's a great source of reducing emissions just like it has been to this point. Incentivizing consumption-based economy-wide emissions reductions and efficiency measures and an immediate focus on regulatory certainty and support for CCUS investment. So on to the Q3 highlights. Operationally, all of our systems ran near capacity and that drove solid numbers. And we're on track, as you saw in our release, to deliver EBITDA and DCF per share within guidance. The balance sheet and financial flexibility are strong and we'll move to the lower end of the target leverage range next year. It was a big quarter execution-wise with $8 billion going into service, which will drive 2022 cash flow. And that's a great outcome in the face of a difficult permitting environment, to say the least. We also accelerated our U.S. export strategy and lower carbon opportunities. So all in good headway on priorities, moving the ball down the field, delivering good results, getting projects in the ground, and building our business for the future. Moving to the business update, beginning with liquids and line three. A month ago now, we completed the U.S. segment, so we're in full operation from Western Canada to the Midwest. And with that, we also brought on the Southern Access expansion to 1.2 million barrels per day into Chicago. Line 3 has always been about modernizing our system, and to my earlier point, it assures Canadian and U.S. refiners have a reliable, low-cost feedstock, providing affordable energy for consumers and industry. Line 3, though, also set a new bar for execution in the field. The world-class environmental measures, actively engaging with communities in a different way, and developing deeper Indigenous partnerships, cultural, environmental, and economic. We've still got work to complete restoration, but I'm proud of how our team brought this one to the finish line. With Line 3 in service, we'll earn the full 93.5 cent surcharge on all mainline barrels, and returning the line to full capacity sets us up for downstream expansion to the Gulf Coast. On Line 5, the existing line and the Great Lakes Tunnel is also about safe and affordable energy. The fact is, Line 5 and the tunnel are essential to Michigan, but also the entire region and two Canadian provinces. 
We're doing everything we can to make sure people's critical energy needs are not cut off, like propane in the Upper Peninsula and jet fuel for the Detroit airport as just two examples of many. Independent experts concluded there's no practical alternative to Line 5 other than thousands of more rail cars and trucks, higher emissions, and increased energy costs. I'm pretty sure people don't want that. In fact, that's what the majority of Michiganders are saying. 80% or so believe the cost of energy is important to them, and there's four to one support for the tunnel. But we've always understood the need to protect the Great Lakes which is why we've gone to extra lengths at the Straits, including continuously and independently verifying the integrity of the line, shutting down the line as a precaution in high wave and wind conditions, and applying the latest in technology to monitor ship traffic to ensure uh, there is no anchor drags. We've committed to build the Great Lakes Tunnel to reduce the risk to as near zero as humanly possible. We received the first tunnel permit last year and we're working on the remaining two. So let's shift gears now to our export strategy. A few years ago, we had a point of view on the evolving global supply demand fundamentals and the need to point infrastructure to the Gulf and to capitalize on growing exports. As you can see, the maps developed out, we've built a big presence in the Gulf. Our export strategy is entirely consistent with the energy transition because North America is a low-cost, sustainable producer of conventional energy. And LNG exports can displace coal, which is going to be a big driver of lowering emissions in Asia. Our U.S. Gulf Coast strategy began with providing full path access for Canadian heavy to the Gulf and establishing a storage and blending hub. We're bolstering our Seaway dock capacity with our Houston oil terminal to provide expanded low-cost waterborne access. We've now built out our light oil export position. Gray Oak initially gave us contracted pipeline ownership into Corpus in Houston, and the Ingleside Energy Center now gives us last-mile connectivity to the light oil export path. Ingleside is North America's premier export terminal, transiting 25% of U.S. exports last year, with 15-plus million barrels of storage and 1.6 million barrels per day of ship loading capacity. Ingleside checked all the strategic, commercial, and financial boxes for us. Its source is crewed from the Permian and Eagleford, connected by 3 million barrels per day of pipe capacity. It's VLCC capable, and it's a prime location on the Outer Harbor. Commercially, take-or-pay commitments fit the business model well, and it came at an attractive valuation, and we're very glad to have retained the operating team. Finally, we evaluate every new investment at Enbridge through an ESG lens, and specifically, we need to see a path to net zero. Ingleside's new state-of-the-art facilities were designed to reduce emissions in the first place, but we're also moving forward with a large inside-the-fence solar farm. That'll allow us to achieve net zero on scope one and two and contribute to scope three reductions. Now, it's worth just delving a bit deeper into why this is a business for the future. It's clear that the Permian is among the most competitive basins globally. And its scale, low break-evens, and proximity to markets means it's essential in any transition scenario. And a competitive supply source in meeting global demand for many years to come. Ingleside has the lowest basin-to-water cost structure of any export point in Corpus or Houston. And that's because our two VLCC berths can load at twice the rate of a Suez Max, and we avoid lightering trips, which, when combined with our outer harbor location, saves roughly five days' transit. We also have capacity to capture incremental barrels, and this is a big upside for us. We'll go after the low-hanging fruit first, which is to contract up existing dock capacity, which could add another 600,000 barrels per day of loadings. And then we'll build into the permitted storage that we already have and dock capacity so another 5.5 million barrels of storage there and 300K of loadings. 
Lastly, as part of our transition lens again, the terminal's location and open land make it an ideal spot for green fuel and carbon capture development. While we're on the topic of exports, Texas Eastern and Valley Crossing are nicely situated along the Gulf, which puts us at the center of the U.S. LNG build-out, and that pace should quicken now, given the global supply crunch. Not much doubt about gas's role in sustaining European and Asian economies, displacing coal, and building renewables. And these fundamentals drive more demand pull on our systems. In just two years, our LNG volumes have doubled to one BCF per day, and we'll add another half a B with our Cameron extension that'll feed Calcasieu this year. We've also built a nice portfolio of late-stage development projects totaling about $2 billion. Bill and his team are also executing a $5 billion secured capital program. $3 billion of that is targeted for in-service this year. We've just completed our two BC expansions for about 600 million cubic feet a day of firm to the lower mainland and U.S. Northwest. In the U.S. Northeast, we've put Middlesex and Appalachia to market into service, but again, as you all know, this region needs a lot more capacity to address reliability and rising energy costs. We're advancing our multi-year modernization program so that will lower emissions and assure the integrity of our system for years to come. But there's more opportunity beyond that. Our new partnership with Vanguard Renewables will develop RNG projects along our system. We're starting with eight projects where we'll provide the injection and transportation assets, and that should total around $100 million of capital. On to our gas utility in Ontario. First, this system is not only critical to the heating market, but meeting peak generation demand. In fact, the ISO's recent study, and I encourage everybody to have a look at this, makes it clear that natural gas is essential to Ontario's energy needs today and in the future. Our franchise also benefits from continued population growth, mostly from immigration. We're on track for another 45,000 customers there this year. Importantly, Ontario has also approved 27 new community expansions. We're planning to sanction new capital for those shortly. Overall, we're executing on $3 billion of utility capital through 2023, so great visibility there to rate-based growth. There's also lower carbon potential. We're developing a sound portfolio of RNG and hydrogen opportunities. On RNG, we've got three in operation and four in construction. And through the Walker Comcore JV, we're developing another 15 projects across Canada with more potentially in the hopper. On hydrogen, our green power facility was completed a couple of years ago, and that proved out the technology and gave us great experience. This quarter, we expanded that facility and put into service the blend hydrogen project, and that will move into our distribution network. The prize here, of course, is to make that happen across the franchise. Finally, to our renewables business and an update on European offshore wind. As you recall, we've got three projects in operation and now three in construction and several opportunities in development. Matthew went through that at Enbridge Day. Offshore France, we've installed 35 foundations at St. Nazaire and another 45 planned through mid-22, so we're on track for in-service there late next year. Later in the schedule at FECOMP, we're building the foundations there right now, and El Calvados, we're manufacturing substation components and subsea cables. These projects will add 1.4 gigawatts of capacity with in-service dates through 2024. As far as development, we've got another 3 gigawatts at various stages, so we have good runway here as well. In North America, we're accelerating our inside defense solar cell power. We've put three facilities into service on our liquids and gas, gas pipelines. And as you can see here, you get a feel for the proximity to our pipelines. We've now started construction on four new projects on the Lakehead and Flanagan systems. 
This phase will be in service next year and will lower our emissions and generate good returns. These projects compete for capital straight up with the rest of our business. Our existing behind the fence land, large power load and renewable capability really give us an advantage in this space. And there's a lot of runway to grow at the compressors and pump stations that you see noted on the map here. So stay tuned for more. All of this is a great example of how we're using our skills that we developed in renewables over the last couple of decades to the rest of our business today. Last point, as part of our new energy business, we've established a dedicated team to coordinate the strategy and allocate capital to the best opportunities. An important element of low carbon strategy, in our view, is partnerships that give us access to technology, complementary assets, and skills. We now have amassed four partnerships, which includes a recent one with Shell, where we'll collaborate on a range of North American opportunities. And with that, let me pass it to Vern to go through the financial results and the priorities there. Thanks, Al, and good morning, everyone. As Al mentioned earlier, my 28 years at Enbridge has given me a great view of the business as a whole, and I look forward to leveraging this experience to my new role as CFO. My focus will be sustaining our track record of disciplined investment and value creation, so don't expect to see any big changes from me. Today I'll start off my remarks with an update on our key financial strategies. Our balance sheet and financial flexibility were in really good shape, or triple B high across the board. We've bolstered our balance sheet capacity by continuing to recycle capital at attractive valuations, another $1.2 billion this year, and increased our EBITDA through organic growth and continued cost reductions. This EBITDA growth provides even more financial flexibility. The resiliency of our cash flows is very strong, providing highly predictable cash flows year after year. This solid base, along with execution on our capital program, has us on track to deliver 2021 results within our EBITDA and DCF guidance ranges. And the capital we placed into service this year will drive a lot of free cash flow growth in 2022 and beyond. We expect to have five to six billion dollars of annual investment capacity beginning in 2022, which we'll be deploying in a disciplined manner. I'll come back to this later. So our foundation is very strong and Q3 was, a, was another solid Enbridge-like quarter. All of our four key finan financial metrics are up year over year on strong performance across our businesses and continued cost containment. Adjusted EBITDA and DCF are up about 10% to $3.3 billion and $2.3 billion, respectively. EPS is up over 20%. Mainline volumes were about 2.7 million barrels per day in Q3, reflecting strong demand for heavy crude in Pad 2 and Pad 3 which was in line with our expectations. Gas utilization has been great, and for the full year, we're seeing the benefits of our rate cases kicking in. The utility continues to be strong. Its cash flows provide stability, and it's throwing off a lot of growth. Finally, our renewables business is performing in line with what we've been expecting. This strong operating performance across all of our core businesses has, however, been partially offset by continued weakness in energy services and the effect of a weaker U.S. dollar on unhedged revenues. In energy services, steep backwardation and historic, historically narrow geographical basis has limited our ability to take advantage of pipeline and storage contracts. FX has been a modest headwind to our operating results. Although we are substantially hedged, this shows up as an add back in our eliminations and other segment. In terms of DCF, maintenance capital was a little lighter than planned. With three quarters of good results in the books, we're well on track to achieve our full year guidance. 
Let's turn to EBITDA. We anticipate strong asset utilization again in Q4. With Line 3 fully in service on October 1, we're expecting fourth quarter EBITDA contributions in line with our guidance of roughly $200 million. And the main line, we expect it to average just around 2.95 million barrels per day. The Moda acquisition closed this month, and it will be a modest tailwind in Q4, with the terminal's contracted volumes ramping up over the next 12 months. On balance, we are anticipating tailwinds and headwinds to be roughly balanced for the rest of the year. Energy services is expected to remain weak through 2021. We saw some warmer weather in October in Ontario, which will negatively impact our utility outlook. And a weaker U.S. dollar will weigh on our operating results net of our hedges. On to DCF. We expect lower interest expense on a weaker U.S. dollar. Timing-related delays to utility maintenance capital and cash savings from higher higher U.S. tax pool utilization, roughly in line with the $100 million we outlined in Q2. As we move towards year-end, our focus will shift to 2022. And here's a few factors that will contribute to our forecast, which we'll provide a much more fulsome review at on our Enbridge Day call. First, the $10 billion of capital that we put into service in 2021 will drive higher EBITDA and cash flows. Ingleside's volumes will ramp up in 2022, growing its EBITDA contribution. And we're expecting strong utilization across all of our systems, including the main line, where we expect 2022 volumes to trend to our Q4 outlook. The gas pipeline and utility businesses are expected to remain remain nicely utilized and capture rate increases. Our renewable projects will remain largely in construction through most of 2022, with St. Nazaire coming into service in the last quarter. And in energy services, we expect losses to moderate in 2022 but we still anticipate a slightly negative contribution next year. Out of the money contracts will begin to roll off late in 2022 and early in 2023. So so that will bring us back to our more normal positive run rate. And finally, relative to our 2021 plan, we expect FX to remain a headwind in 2022. As usual, we'll roll out our formal guidance for 2022 in December. Uh, The outlook for our balance sheet is similarly strong. We've just now completed our 2021 financing plan, including 2.4 billion of sustainably linked bonds at historically attractive interest rates. Despite the full spending associated with line three, and the Moda acquisition, with only partial year EBITDA contribution, our year-end credit metric is expected to remain within our 4.5 to 5.0 policy range. So that's a good outcome. So with a full year of contribution in 2022 from this capital and the Noverico sale proceeds, we'll drive debt to EBITDA down to the low end of our credit metric range in 2022. That's going to provide a lot of financial flexibility and continues to support our triple B high credit rating. I'm sure you're wondering about inflation, so let me spend a minute on how we're thinking about it. Recall roughly 80% of our EBITDA has toll escalators or regulatory mechanisms that protect us And if we continue our cost management track record, this could actually provide a small tailwind for us. Our strategy to procure materials and equipment early has so far shielded us from any significant inflationary impacts to date. So let's shift to how we'll deploy our investment capacity. 
In 2022, we anticipate five to six billion dollars of annual investment capacity and will be disciplined in terms on how we invest this to maximize shareholder value. We'll provide more detail at Enbridge Day, but our big picture priorities have not changed. Protecting our balance sheet remains our first priority and we'll sure we'll have plenty of financial flexibility and buffer. That includes continuing to evaluate opportunities for further capital recycling where it makes sense. We expect to grow the dividend rateably up to the level of medium term DCF growth with an eye to migrating to our payout to about the midpoint of our 60 to 70 percent payout range. Our base businesses will continue to kick out three to four billion of organic growth opportunities per year with attractive returns. That's growth in the utility, gas pipeline modernization, and low capital liquids pipelines expansions. The next two billion will go to the next best alternative and we'll assess share buybacks, adding more organic growth, asset M&A, and further deleveraging. As we have said before, share buybacks have risen in, in the order of priority and we continue to believe with the predictability of our cash flows, our rateable growth, our asset and our asset longevity, we are currently undervalued at our current share price. I'm excited that we have this financial strength and flexibility to optimize our capital allocation and shareholder returns. So finally, to wrap up, our annual Enbridge Day will be on December 7th this year. As usual, we'll use this event to update you on our financial outlook and our strategic priorities. We're planning for the event to be in person in, in Toronto, so we look forward to seeing you there. Of course, we'll have a webcast too for those wanting to attend virtually. So with that, I'll turn it back to Al. Okay, thanks, Vern. Uh, just a couple of takeaways here. Uh, 2021, as you heard, is a pivotal year for us. The business is performing well and is generating highly predictable results. We're executing the priorities that we laid out at the last Enbridge Day, and we're on track to put in $10 billion of capital into service this year. That will generate a lot of cash flow, as you just heard. So with that, let me hand it back to the operator for Q&A. We're not uh, yet all in the same room here, so I'll direct questions as needed. So back to the operator. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star on your touchtone phone. Again, that's star one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound or hash key. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star one on your touchtone phone. If you're like me, whenever you listen to the news, you feel forced to choose between two toxic sides. But people are more complicated. They don't fit neatly into just two groups, and media should reflect that. That's where the lost debate steps in. What's up, guys? I'm Corey Bradford. And I'm Ravi Gupta, and we're the hosts of The Lost Debate. This country is more politically divided now than ever before. But we're not as different as the mainstream media makes us out to be. That's why we launched The Lost Debate, it's a podcast and YouTube show for the politically eclectic who've lost trust in our polarizing, partisan world. And we'll bring you news, ideas, and trends that are overlooked. We'll also bring people together to have the conversations the media isn't having, to empathize with each other and challenge each other in good faith. And some political satire and skits, because why the hell not? New episodes drop Tuesdays and Thursdays. Lost Debate on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And your first question comes from the line of Robert Kwan with RBC Capital Markets. Great. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to dig into the, the comments you made 
to start around at capital allocation and specifically that two billion dollar bucket um you had some comments just around share buybacks and you see your shares as being undervalued i'm just wondering whether you um similar to what you did about a year ago be willing to rank order um, those options and as it relates to dividend growth i think Bern, you mentioned up to um the growth the uh, the underlying growth um, I don't know if you can just kind of frame that comment in light of what your friends across the street did uh, this morning. Okay, Robert. Um, I, I think on the capital allocation, um, it's really great that we have the capacity to look at all of these different options. Obviously, what, when we make these decisions, uh, there's a number of pros and cons to each of them. On the share buyback front, uh, it's great that we can invest in Enbridge uh, as, as the company continues to grow its DCF and its cash flows. Uh, a share buyback lowers our payout. It provides uh, dividend savings, and obviously it's executable. But some of the cons are that it doesn't provide any further organic growth, doesn't add uh, incremental EBITDA, and doesn't help us with our long, -term, long and medium-term cash uh, horizon. So uh, I think what we'd like to do is look at that in concert with all of the other opportunities that we have. And as we work through 2020, 2022 and beyond, we'll make sure that we make the best decision uh, for our shareholders. Uh, if we turn to the dividend, uh, obviously dividend growth is a key component of our value proposition. We, continue, we plan to continue to grow it. Um, but we have some other competing priorities as well. Um, in the near to medium term, we'd like to get back to the middle, uh, middle part of our policy range. And at this present time, we don't believe the market's fully valuing the level of the dividend that we provide today. So uh, hopefully that provides some clarity for your question there. Yeah, that's great, Vern. Um, and if I can just finish with a question on the oil pipeline side, with L3R done, you've talked in the past about other oil pipeline expansions. Um, just wondering if there's any update on those now that L3R is in service, and are, are any of these projects somewhat imminent but waiting and being held back pending clarity on the mainline contracting uh, situation? So I think we'll get uh, Colin to respond to that, Robert. Hey, Robert. Um, yeah, we're excited that uh, obviously the Line 3 is in service and uh, immediately being being useful uh, and well utilized. And um, we do have a, uh, a batting order of, of expansions, um, cost-effective ones, by the way, lined up, as we've talked about for some time. Our system is, is vast, um, it's complex, and it continually provides um, you know creative solutions that we can we can harness as we have uh, you know through the last number of years you know these range from uh, drag reducing agent uh, horsepower on existing uh, pipes um, potentially some reversals or even repurposing so the, the same roster I would say that you're uh, familiar with is uh, is being teed up here um, it'll be dependent on, on customer interest and um, uh, I, I think in part uh, industries, um, you know, emerging uh, need to sustain some excess egress uh, and, and multiple options to market. I think that that's, that's a concept that's been um, absent for a couple of decades and uh, we'll do our best to, to fill that, that need. So um, uh, we'll talk more about this at Enbridge Day. That's what that day is designed for. But uh, we are excited about the prospects here. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we also have Jeremy Tonette with J.P. Morgan online with a question. Hi. Good morning. Hello. I just wanted to start off with uh, the Ingleside acquisition there. Uh, I know it's uh, very recent since you guys closed, but just – didn't know if you could provide any kind of updated thoughts as far as, uh, you know, 
now that you have it, how is it uh, executing versus your expectations? And I guess more specifically, when we think about the crude oil export side, um, you know, we've seen kind of trends shifting there a bit, given where the uh, differentials are. So wondering if you could provide any more thoughts, I guess, on how you see those trending in the near term. Colin? Yeah, sure. Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, so we're uh, pretty excited about this. Uh, you know, the market for the Permian barrel is increasingly global, as you know. It's it's large and growing, and it's going to play a long-term role in in uh, energy export and energy transition. Uh, we closed the transaction a few weeks ago uh, now, but I would say our Q4 outlook and our 22 outlook is, is quite encouraging. Um, we're seeing... Uh, export loadings rateably wrapping up quite nicely and in line with, with upstream drilling rig uh, account trajectories, so that's good. And I'd say uh, it's also very consistent with our purchase economics. Um, we have uh, multiple commercial expansion offerings in flight to leverage uh, the operating leverage that, that, that Al talked about and, and the, the fixed cost pre-built uh, facility that's, that's, that's there. Uh, some of these offerings are a continuation of commercial offerings that, that the, the prior management team and owner had in, uh, in flight and uh, some additional ones on our own. We're looking at multiple types of products uh, to, to export, and uh, we've had some good inbound in interest, I would say, here right off, right off the bat. So um, I, I think it's, it's looking uh, generally pretty positive here, Jeremy. Maybe just to add, Jeremy, one point um, to that, you know, really in terms of your part of your question around differentials and, and where they ebb and flow, the way we look at this, this one is this is highly contracted facility. So the way the economics uh, work in our, in our model is we've got that base uh, and then we, we sort of uh, look at it as upside if, if the differentials point our way and, and the producer's way. And so really, uh, I think good upside here uh, to global uh, dynamics, which, which you know uh, are, are likely going to look for more uh, low-cost, reliable, light crude from, from North America. So that's just uh, how we look at it in the bigger picture. Got it. That's uh, very helpful there. And then maybe just want to pivot to, uh, I guess, uh, energy transition side a little bit. Um, RNG seems like it's quite active in the Canadian side. Just wondering on the U.S. side if uh, you see opportunities there or, uh, you know, how much capital could be deployed in general. Yeah. Well, Bill's probably closest to the U.S. side uh, given the new uh, opportunity there with Vanguard. So maybe, Bill, why don't you take that? Yeah, you know, Jeremy, I think the Vanguard Renewables partnership that we uh, announced is is a really good step. Um, you know, we have line of sight to a hundred million dollars worth of worth of projects. You know, in the near term, so it's kind of a good place to to dip our toe in the water. And you know, the model that we're setting up really it really gives us line of sight to even more. So that, like I said, toe in the water, uh, really really good stuff there. I think the in addition to that partnership, though, you've really got to think about our longstanding relationship with all of the uh, LDC customers, so all of our utilities that you know are, are somewhat active in this space. And, you know, that, that, the relationship there could, could extend from partnerships uh, to, to do, do some RNG projects together uh, to just simply – uh, we do a project and 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 have a resale to to them as they uh, as we both strive to meet our you know our emissions targets. So I, I I think it's got a lot of potential. I mean, how much is is yet to be seen. It's it's pretty amazing when some a place like the AGA comes out with a, a statement saying, well, you know, RNG could meet half the heating load, you know, over the next uh, I forget the timeline, ten or twenty years. That's that's pretty impressive. Got it. Thanks for that. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. And your next question comes from the line of Ben Pham with BMO. Please go ahead. Good morning. I want to stay on energy tra transition. And I'm, I'm wondering, when you look at uh, energy 
uh, transition opportunities and you put them through your, your filter, you look at their risk reward. Is there, would it be any significant difference in, in how you look at those investments versus your existing portfolio? Is it different returns, different risk profiles, different counterparties? Would, would love to comment on that. Okay. Uh, it's a help, Ben. So I would say uh, it's exactly the same as we look at the rest of our business. And uh, as Vern referred to, we'll continue to be very disciplined as we're putting capital to work in the future. So maybe the way to think about this at a high level is if you look at what we have um, in flight right now, if you look at wind, solar, uh, you know, some initial RNG um, uh, and hydrogen investments, they're pretty much right in line with uh, the, the business model that you're used to seeing from us. Uh, and in the, in the case of hydrogen, for example, with the two projects uh, that we're working on in Ontario and then a third one in Quebec, they'll be incubated, if you want to look at it that way, uh, within um, you know, the existing commercial model where we're assured a return on and, and re return of capital. So I think uh, that's the way we're looking at it. We've probably got $2 billion in flight now in terms of energy transition category. Uh, and I would say that over the next five years, you're probably looking at that same level, call it a billion dollars a year. I think what's to be determined, though, longer term, is how fast hydrogen and other areas like CCUS develop. So I think for the next five years, we don't see massive amounts of capital being deployed there other than these uh, core areas that we're working on right now. So hopefully that provides some context. Can I make just a quick yeah. add-on? Um, the other thing that we're doing is when we look at our traditional investments now, we do add the price of carbon to each of those investments. And we also increase the hurdle rate slightly because of the the energy transition risks on some of those opportunities. So with, uh, with these energy transition assets, obviously uh, those adders aren't applied. Yeah, and again, again, I think you've seen uh, the chart we use for this, Ben. Uh, the whole game here for us is to really utilize the existing assets to uh, to leverage those assets into low carbon opportunities. So you see it in the utility, you see it in Bill's business, uh, and you see it with uh, solar self power, which uh, links right up to our, our conventional business. Okay, great. And then my second question, mainline CR decision around the corner. Uh, do you expect a CR, CR decision that effectively be a, a yes and no as you've applied the application as it stands, or is there a situation where they can give you a blanket approval subject to conditions on contract levels and, and tolls? Colin? Yeah, hey, Ben. You know, I, we're waiting for this imminently, right? Um, and it's, it's unclear uh, precisely the form of the decision that, that will come. Um, I think they have a, an array of, of choices here, but um, obviously we, we strongly uh, believe in the one we filed for with, with the variety of benefits uh, we included in it that were, as you recall, requested by, by industry. So um, we'll, we'll look forward to that. Um, and I would say... If, if the decision is acceptable, and I would emphasize this next word, in its totality, right, um, we would proceed to the next stage, which would be commercial contracting and then, you know, finality by mid-22. Um, if, it's, if it's not acceptable, again, in its totality, uh, from a risk-reward perspective for our capital providers, we, we could refile uh, for something else that would be. Uh, and I think we've laid out some options there. Uh, over the last couple of years. So I will have to wait and see, Ben. Okay. And Snoor Grusini with the UBS is online with the question. Thank you, everyone. Um, I was just uh, looking at slide 23 and 
uh, you know, we're kind of you present the, the outlook and the preliminary 22 outlook. Uh, although there's no number, I did try with my ruler to figure it out. But um, I guess my question here is, is that, you know, you, you sort of highlighted the in terms of the positive benefits um, and negative benefits, um, obviously the dollar and energy services, um, you know, it's headwinds, but you, you sort of included MODA um, as well as the, the benefit of the 21 growth capex. I, I was wondering if you can sort of talk about um, any other tailwinds that you're seeing, um, you know, Al, you, in your prepared remarks, you talked about, um, you know, kind of the energy crisis that's going on right now. Um, are there any inflation escalators, you know, tied to PPI and CPI that, that could potentially benefit uh, Enbridge? Um, just kind of curious what other tailwinds that we could be thinking about where you could see some operating leverage within the existing system, not just with respect to the growth capex coming online. Yep. Well, uh, maybe I'll just I'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, first of all, on your question around inflation, I think, as, as Vern uh, mentioned, there's a very large majority of our uh, EBITDA and revenue that's driven uh, by indexing of some sort. Uh, that's off of inflation. So that's, that's a plus. Uh, I think in terms of the commodity uh, part of your question, you know, as you know, we're not, uh, you know, hugely driven by uh, commodity prices given our business model, but there are a couple things uh, around uh, NGLs that we have, for example, at Ox Sable. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of a tailwind uh, with some excess capacity we might have in, in market gas. Uh, you know, to, to capitalize on that. I would say, you know, a big part of what we've been focused on in the last two, three years, though, Schneer, is uh, cost management. And, uh, you know, that's not to be underestimated, uh, especially since every dollar you save uh, is certainly very helpful from a, a balance sheet perspective. And so those are the general categories of tailwinds beside uh, the, the bigger ones that uh, Vern mentioned. Okay, great. Um, and so, just to clarify before asking my second question, there there isn't like line three is bringing more volumes and part of your assets elsewhere will see benefits as well too. Or, I'm sorry, could you just clarify that, Schneer? It, it, just the fact that like line three replacement is now in service, that there would be more volumes flowing through, that there could be more operating leverage elsewhere in the system. Yeah, I think you know we're probably going to be pretty much at capacity, um, at least that's the way we've modeled it out so far with line three now in service. I think the benefits, there may be some marginal benefits with additional volumes here and there, probably not huge. Uh, the big upside though, of course, is now that we have it in place, as, as was mentioned, um, you know, there'll be some downstream expansion possibility there that, you know, looks pretty good. And, and remember, those are going to be very low capital intense opportunities so uh, right down the fairway for us uh, at this part of the cycle so we'll, we'll do well on those it, that makes perfect sense and, and for the second question um, just to go back to the the acquisition of moda um, just kind of wanted to understand your broader strategy with respect to to exports um, you acquired moda does it change your view on spot um, or it's part of a larger strategy just given the, the slide that you you would put out um, are you looking to add more connectivity to Corpus now with respect to having Moda in place? And, and would you be expanding that export strategy to include LNG potentially as well also? Uh -huh. uh, well, maybe I'll start it off, um, then we'll go to Colin. So this part of the strategy was really all about uh, the second leg commodity-wise. So as you know, we were the first ones to build that path on the heavy uh, barrels into the Gulf Coast over the last several years. This was really about now covering the, the light oil side. And we're so happy about this because of the, the, uh, the sheer competitiveness of the Permian and Eagleford on global market scale. And so with, with Moda being the lowest cost um, uh, infrastructure to market, uh, we really think we're in ideal position here to capitalize on the upside that we think will come from exports. Uh, we talked about LNG. I, I actually see this as an equally powerful strategy. Uh, where we're located on the Gulf and how we're hooked up to existing LNG 
And importantly, uh, I talked about $2 billion of LNG projects in development. We are lining up really well with new FID uh, projects, uh, potentially in the next little while, where we'll have captured uh, the, the pipeline uh, capacity that, that feeds those LNG plants. So that's the real big picture and how we're thinking about exports. Uh, Colin, any more to add on Moda? Yeah, sure. And I think uh, I just referenced you back to slides 10 and 13, where we're developing out gradually, and, and I'd say in a disciplined manner, export maps in both crude oil and, and LNG. Um, and they're really coming into focus. On, on crude in particular, you can see on slide 10, we've got uh, a number of, you know, a diverse uh, roster here in, in multiple points across the Gulf. Um, and that, that fits the strategy I was talking about. Um, so, so primarily a light uh, uh, focus at, at Corpus. Uh, yes, we're still interested in spot. That would be uh, likely a more medium heavy um, export market and, and would, would feed off our, our, uh, our, our seaway path and, and all the way from, from Canada. Um, uh, potentially down the road we could connect um, seaway over to Corpus. Uh, so, so that you can get a sense of, of what we're trying to build out here. Does that help? No, perfect. That was uh, a very thorough uh, answer. I really appreciate the color. Um, thanks a lot, and have a great weekend. Okay, Schneer, thanks. Robert Cotillier with CIBC Capital Markets is online with a question. Hi, good morning. Uh, you referred a little bit to inflation earlier in your comments, and uh, as you're no doubt aware, uh, some industrial users have been uh, calling for uh, a, a reduction in LNG exports in order to help mitigate the impact on price. So, you know, obviously that's a reactionary um, uh, comment, but uh, I'm wondering if uh, the current inflation environment has had any change, um, any impact on how you look at the LNG fundamentals over the longer term. Bill, do you want to comment on what you're hearing on the ground on that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Rob, not we're not hearing that, to be honest. I mean, this is... <laughs> I can only say suddenly we're in the market. We're in the market that we'd hope for. Um, you know, I think I, I think we've seen a number of offtake contracts signed. Um, can think of you know five very recent ones. Um, many of them are those projects that that we've got our eyes on that that help us build out our infrastructure, and we think there's more to come. So. I could get into a much longer answer, but but the short answer is I I don't I don't see the momentum stopping right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rob. Rob Hope with Scotia Bank is online with the question. Uh, morning, everyone. Want to delve into the mainline volume 2022 outlook. Um, maybe what are the puts and takes as we enter into 2022? Like, as I, as I understand, uh, heavy still under apportionment. Um, there's a bit of a ramp in, in line three there as well. So is it just seasonality with some outages in the back half of the year? And I guess secondly, you know, if you get a favorable mainline ruling, could we see, you know, maybe some DRA expansions providing some upside here? Go yeah, hey, Rob, it's Colin. Yeah, so uh, we'll provide – some more uh, color on this at Enbridge Day for sure and, and give you a sense of seasonality as well. Uh, it, it is an average, I think, and I think Vern mentioned uh, we're looking at you know, next year, you know, in the same neighborhood of 2.95 million barrels per day. That's an average. There's seasonality of that, a bunch of factors. Um, it, it's, it's largely full. So, uh, uh, yeah, there may be some operating leverage uh, here and there, but that's uh, that's that's the gist of it. Um, yeah, you mentioned apportionment. We've we've come down uh, nicely. I think we were in the 40, 50 percent apportionment range, and now we're down kind of 10-ish, and we'll see where that goes in uh, in December. Um, I think uh, all, all market participants are adjusting to uh, uh, 
you know, the, the new dynamic with the step change in, in line three uh, capacity and, uh, and, uh, and, and cap line as well as coming into service. Uh, January 1 is line filling right now and uh, by the way that should be a, a positive uh, pull through our system and, and the various pipes like Saks and, and Mustang as well so uh, I think we feel pretty good about that uh, 2.95 area I'll kind of blur the uh, specificity of it for now but uh, generally full I think is how you should think about it and I, and I think Colin to his question around DRA opportunity. I think in terms of how we're looking at the outlook for 22 at this point, we haven't contemplated any of that in, a, in additional DRA at this point, but correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's good clarification. Yeah, that probably uh, bridges back to, to Robert's question at the beginning. So we would think about that as, as a further tranche of, of growth uh, down the road. All right, that's helpful. And then just circling back to your comments on the mainline uh, recontracting initiative and taking a look at the decision in its totality, you know, a lot has changed through the, you know, you know many uh, years that this has been going on. You know, with the demise of Keystone XL, has the amount of contracts on the system, you know, gone down in, in priority for you, whereas the total uh, level has increased or kind of maybe put some takes on how you're thinking about that decision? Yeah, again, back to totality, you're right, there there are things that, that have changed, probably uh, some favorable, some unfavorable. Um, it remains uh, industry's general preference to contract the line for all the reasons, uh, uh, toll certainty, um, that's been a historical tenant of all our uh, arrangements for the last 25 years. Uh, access to capacity, you know, following 20 years of, of egress deficit, and uh, and the toll we're looking at here is, as a reminder, it's basically a, an extension of the of the toll on at the exit of our expiry here, and with with toll discounts, it's actually lower for many. Um, so um, I think we would also, uh, you know, prefer to, to contract the line. Um, there all are vulnerabilities. Uh, out in the planning horizon as, as Trans Mountain comes on. So, uh, again, the totality concept, you know, applies to that balance of risk reward we're trying to trying to optimize. So, again, we're going to have to carefully review the decision. Um, and, uh, if, like I said, if it works, we'll proceed. If not, we'll we'll, we'll uh, refile something else, either a, a fixed tariff tolling arrangement like the ones we've had for for 25 years, or or a cost of service arrangement where uh, cash flows are, are protected. Yeah, and I was just going to mention on that last point, Colin, uh, for Rob, you know, the other way to look at this is, you know, what the, the shippers are actually uh, not very excited about, which uh, we've heard very clearly from them that cost of service uh, is something they'd not prefer. Uh, and there's issues with... Uh, the, the commercial structure with an exist, the existing type of arrangement. So I think it's almost when you triangulate what they've really pushed for, which is contracting, uh, we still think that's uh, you know the best outcome uh, for them and, and for us. And, and it's been driven over, as Colin said, uh, a long time in discussion with industry. Thank you. Okay, this concludes the question and answer session. I will now turn the call over to Jonathan Morgan for final remarks. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. As always, we appreciate your ongoing interest in Enbridge. Uh, our investor relations team will be available following the call to address any follow-up questions you may have. So once again, thank you and have a great weekend. And thank you. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for your pre participation. You are appreciated. You may now disconnect. If you feel forced to choose between two toxic sides when you listen to the news, you're not alone. 
That's where the Lost Debate steps in. What's up, guys? I'm Corey Bradford. And I'm Robbie Gutte. We launched the Lost Debate, a podcast and YouTube show for the politically eclectic who've lost trust in our polarizing partisan world. We'll bring you the overlooked news, ideas, and trends from around the country, and some political satire and skits, because why the hell not? The Lost Debate, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.